Uh, via telephone, Fred Albert, president of the American Federation of Teachers, West Virginia chapter. Good morning, Fred. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well, and I'm sitting alone with my own cup of coffee. So <laughs> I hope if I, if I spill it, I only spill it on myself. And if you do, remember you're on live radio. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that reminder. Yes, and, and live TV, too. We, we were able to, by the way, get that uh, rectified about half an hour ago. I guess there was a power outage yesterday, and TV 10 went dark a little after 5 o'clock. They got it uh, taken care of earlier this morning in the 7 o'clock hour, so we're back up and running completely fine here. Uh, John, how familiar are you with Fred from your days in the uh, legislature? And you would be talking to John Doyle, right? John Doyle, yeah. we got two Johns here on the show today. Oh, I'm <laughs> Fred and I know each other really well. I would think, right? And I have yes, great respect do. for Fred, and I very and often agree with Fred, but every now and then I don't. <laughs> is well, that about I it, Fred? <laughs> I can just say, yes, uh, you're exactly right, and it is so good to hear your voice, John Doyle, and John Gilstrap as well, but John Doyle, I miss seeing you, and uh, I really do appreciate all that you have done for our state, and it's always good to hear your, your voice. Well, thank you. Fred, let's talk, uh, if we could, first and foremost, about PEIA and another 10% increase for your folks in the teaching and service community in the state of West Virginia on top of a 24% increase that took place last year? Well, I'm, I, I kind of figured that's what you wanted to talk about. Yes, sir. Uh, last night, I attended the hearing, the finance board, PEIA finance board hearing here in Charleston at the West Virginia Culture Center. Um, and I had attended the meeting last week in Morgantown because we had our AFT West Virginia Convention in Morgantown, so it was convenient for me to make the hearing there as well. Um, you know, it, it's troubling because we were told by the current governor that there would never be a premium increase on his watch, and we're still on Governor Justice's watch. But I, I think that's – and I appreciate what the governor has tried to do, but that really has caused us to have now these premium increases that are going to be unsustainable for us um, because it's not stopping here. Uh, the projection is over the next five years, there will be a total of like a 66.8% increase for all public employees who are active participants of PEIA. So it, it's – something that we have said for years we need to find a, a funding source we've tried to work with others with legislators as john doyle well knows uh, to try to find that funding source and it hasn't happened so here we are uh, on the backs of our state employees school teachers service personnel uh, first responders we had a good group of first responders there last night some county commission employees were there um, protesting these increases that are going to be unsustainable in the future. And, and let me say, it, we don't expect to not have some skin in the game. We know that health care costs continue to rise, and we know that as participants in this health program, which is, was given to us as a benefit in lieu of pay raises over the years, that we're going to have to pay some increased premiums. But all of this at once is is difficult to take yeah fred you you may remember my last year in the legislature uh all through the interims we had a special committee on peia and i was a member of that committee and yes. the last four sets of interims the house had a plan that i that i thought wasn't perfect but made sense and right. and the governor made sure that that committee did not meet the last four sets of interims because the governor didn't want that thing passed. All right. The PEIA finance board is proposing 10 and percent premium increases and no benefits changes for state employees who get the insurance. 13% premium increases for employees of local governments that opt into PEIA plus the addition of a surcharge for eligible spouses of approximately $147 no changes in premiums or benefits for retirees who are eligible for Medicare. 10% premium increases and no changes in benefits for people who are old enough to have retired but not old enough to be eligible for Medicare. That's correct. So, yes. uh, Fred, from a math standpoint, 
there have been raises. There was a, a, basically a stipend given last year to help offset that premium increase. What type of a raise would you need just to stay even with a 10.5% premium increase for teachers and staff? Well, that, that's a very good question. And, you know, uh, thankfully, the governor has said that he doesn't want people to hurt uh, and that he is going to propose, I, I believe I heard him say, another 5% pay increase for all public employees, which, you know, that it, it sounds like, wow, a 5% increase. Everyone loves a 5% increase of their salary, but that's the average salary. So it ends up being about $2,500, $2,400 a year for profession, for teachers, not quite as much for uh, service personnel. However, I think last year they did get the, the uh, a little larger raise, but that's not enough to to actually realize a pay raise if it's being taken away by the premiums that you're paying into PEIA. And, and the other group that's really going to hurt are our retirees who've given their lives to uh, the families of West Virginia and the service that they've provided. Um, they're going to realize a 10% increase, and they're on a fixed income. And once you once you retire, that's what you get. They don't have a cost of living increase. Last year, the legislature did help those uh, who had been retired for 20 years or more uh, and made less than a thousand dollars a year on their a thousand dollars a month on their retirement. But here's the other issue, you know. And I don't know if you know the latest numbers, but last week at the state board meeting, we were told uh, board of education meeting the number of teacher teaching. Uh, vacancies that we have this year have risen again by about 200 and some last year it was 1544 this year it's 1705 that number continues to rise the same with service personnel we can't get enough bus drivers and cooks and classroom aides this is not an incentive to get more into the classroom more teachers and more service personnel in our schools so a pay raise is is great and we appreciate the governor's efforts and the legislators efforts but it's not enough to make a real difference and i've also heard that um uh, one of the senators said you know they're they're not really hopeful that that they can give us a pay raise this year so i don't know Fred, but, and, and our teachers are also currently from the statistics i've been able to have um 50th in the country as far as pay. pay. Uh, Fred, this is John Gilstrap. We talk yes. in terms of percentages and that sort of thing. In absolute numbers, what what does it cost out of a teacher's pocket to have the health insurance PEIA? Well, John, that's a good question. It depends on your uh, coverage, and I, I, I don't have that figure for you. I know that, you know, last year uh, we already were, if teachers who have their spouses on the plan, they're now this past year, starting this past July, they're paying the penalty of $147 a, a month um, for having a spouse on their plan if their spouse works and has uh, uh, insurance available to them through their employer. But the, the exact amount, uh, I, I don't have that for you, John. I'm sorry. Is there, uh, I believe it varies based on your income too, does it not, Fred? It does, yes, and and the plan that you're in. So, I'm I'm really in the dark on that at the moment. In a ballpark, hundreds a year, thousands a year, or tens of thousands, oh, thousands a year. Thousands a year, of course. And then if you have your spouse, you, you know, you multiply 147 dollars times 12. Huh? That's that gives you an idea there. Um, so it is thousands a year. I know that one one lady last, spoke last year at a, a press conference that we held there in the Capitol Rotunda. She was a service personnel, and she would actually be taking home less on her paycheck once the increases took place in July. And uh, she had a spouse that she has coverage for, so she's she's going to be taking home less money uh, than she has in the past. The news this time last year, I want to say, give or take, was that uh, 
hospitals and doctors were no longer accepting PEIA, and the PEIA was, as a program, was was facing yes. its own collapse. So, what's the alternative to raising well, premium? Well, a- as John Doyle said, um, you know, after 2018, there was a task force put together, uh, stakeholders all across the spectrum traveled around the state. They listened to PEIA participants in all corners of our state, and they had a plan, but it just sort of faded away. And I don't recall exactly the, all the details of that plan because I was not in my office at that particular time as state fed president, but I did listen to those meetings that they live streamed. Um, and, and there were thoughts and plans put together to find a funding source, and, and that just sort of faded away. Yeah, it faded so away. So our ask is let's, let's – this is up on the legislatures. The, the finance board can only do so much. They have to manage the money that is budgeted for PEIA, and it's up to the legislators to provide the funding. And, you know, we talk all the time about the surpluses that we have in our state budget, uh, over a billion dollars, $1.8 billion or something to that effect. Um, I would say this is the time to seriously look at what can we do going forward to help fund PEIA so it's on more solid ground. Fred, And we don't have to continue to have these uh, premium increases put on the backs of our employees. Yeah, Fred, you're right. I was not on the task force. I was on that special interim subcommittee that was formed right. after the task force came in with its report. And we were pretty much going to uh, going to adopt what the what the task force had said, with with with, uh, with a few exceptions. Uh, and Matt Rohrbach, who was health chair uh, at at the time, and he may still be, but he was very much in favor of that. And he got stymied really by the governor, and nobody could figure out why it would be right before the an, an interim session of a particular month would go in and they'd send word out well uh peia committee meeting has been canceled uh it would always be like the day before and you knew there were some shenanigans going on but but Mm -hmm. you couldn't figure out what they were and you're absolutely right it is on the legislature by our constitution the legislature appropriates money this is true in every state in the union uh, and the federal government what I am, am, am disturbed about is back when I was in, when the Democrats were in and I was vice chair of the finance committee for 10 years, we would fairly frequently challenge the governor's proposal for a budget. Didn't make a difference who the governor was. Uh, 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 Democrats, Wise and Caperton, uh, uh, Cecil Underwood, a Republican, we, we got along with them fine. But we did not take the attitude that whatever initial budget proposal they came up with, we were to simply rubber stamp and pass it. I've noticed in recent years, whatever budget Jim Justice sends to the legislature pretty much gets passed without a whole lot of questions. And I think that that is part of the problem. If the legislature would do its job and analyze every proposal, every line item in the governor's proposed budget, I think you could find the money to handle this. Yes. Well, you know, we seem to find money to do other things like give tax breaks to companies that we want to bring their business here. And I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't help companies bring their businesses here, but we need to take care of our own people in our state who are giving up their lives to, you know, they're dedicated to what they do and they want to stay here and they want to have a good living. Um, and they want to have good benefits and the benefits were given to them over the years in lieu of any pay increase. So, a benefit is a benefit if it's only if it's a benefit. Well, let let me be deliberately provocative here, just for the sake of argument. It's I've been a private sector person my my whole life, and mm-hmm. before we reached that that magic age when I, I get to go on the on the government dole, uh, my wife and I are paying twenty four thousand dollars a year for our kind of inadequate health insurance. So, when it comes to attracting the hearts and minds and sympathies of private sector folks um the for the PEIA isn't it still quite a bargain 
for for what it is out of the teachers' pockets or any public employees' pockets? Well, I would say the PEIA program is is a good program, but also you're comparing different salary levels. Uh, you know, our public employees. This is something that uh, Joe White, the executive director of the service personnel, said last night at the meeting in Charleston. Do you know that our legislators make more in the 60 days that they're in session than some of our school cooks who work a full year or the 200 days under their employment? So you're comparing different salary structures as well. Yeah, and also, it's important to note, and Fred, you, know, you and I remember this, but a lot of people now don't. For years, up until maybe about 10, 12 years ago, there was no premium. And salaries were fairly low, but one of the benefits that, that West Virginia uh, touted for public employees was, yes, your salary is lower than it would have been, but we're taking care of your health care as part of that. So that's an that's an added benefit. And it was and, and it, again, it was decent health care and none of the employees had to pay out of pocket for any of it. Maybe maybe a five dollar copay or something like that. But they didn't have to pay any premiums. When we went to a system where we said, OK, we're going to have to have this system pay for itself. Now the salaries are simply not adequate. When did that happen? I think it was about 10, 12 years ago. So, Fred, I believe you're right, John. I don't have the exact date, but you're you're exactly right. Fred, is this ultimately? And, and as, uh, pardon. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, you can finish. I'm, 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 well, I'm just saying, you know, for years and years and years, that's what we were told. Your salaries are not the greatest. Uh, you you could live in West Virginia and travel over to Maryland or Virginia, or places in Ohio possibly that are close to the border of West Virginia, and make more money if you want to do that. Uh, as a teacher or a school support personnel, but our benefits, our health care benefits are really good. And that was the caveat that, uh, you know, was used to attract people to stay here in West Virginia. I will tell you, we're losing, we're losing our educators. We're losing our support staff because they are, they're no longer buying into that and they're, they're leaving. They're just leaving employment and they're going elsewhere. So, Fred, what would the answer be here in this situation that's ideal for all parties? We've seen the projections for what PEIA costs will be going into the future, and, and it doesn't take uh, too many years for those costs to get pretty astronomical in terms of what the state's contribution would be to keep the premiums at uh, right now a level number where they are. Uh, you don't make enough in, uh, in, in teaching and also for the custodial positions you were referring to earlier to be able to afford significant premium increases. So, and then you have a system that needed some serious government assistance just to prop it back up to the point where the hospitals would take it again just in the last year. Mm -hmm. So what is the answer here that makes everybody reasonably uncomfortable yet reasonably satisfied? Well, perhaps a pay increase that's more than $2,500 a year. Maybe we're talking about $10,000 more a year. Uh, if if our teacher salaries are 50th in the nation, maybe that would be the place we could start looking. Uh, how can we really give a pay raise where the pay raise is going to be realized and not taken back to provide to pay for a benefit? It's funny, Fred. Uh, about uh, what five years ago, uh, six years maybe, uh, the big teacher strike uh, that produced uh, a, a pay raise. Which, which the people in charge referred to as the biggest teacher pay raise in the state's history, which, of course, it was not. wasn't anywhere near that, but they're calling it that uh, in terms of, of, of hard dollars it is, but not in terms of constant dollars or, or percentage of pay. But at any rate, immediately all the other bottom feeder states raised their teacher pay more than West Virginia, so we're still 50th <laughs> after supposedly the biggest pay raise in history. Well, that's because it was touted as, well, we're giving you a 5% pay increase. And as I said earlier, yeah. yes, 5%, but it's 5% of the average together salary. So it, it amounted to about, 20, at that time, I think it was 2250 a year. And then we, we know what happened. Um, so it's, it's, 
disheartening. Uh, again, we, we had a task force in place that just went a, a, away. Uh, but people were actually very, very interested in finding a solution. And, you know, teachers are very creative people. And we worked well with others who were not necessarily educators, but we, we thought we had some ideas and some viable plans. I would say let's reinstitute that task force and, and get some ideas from a collective body. Fred, when I interview, sorry, John, when I interview uh, elected officials, they say, listen, we've provided three 5% pay raises since Republicans have taken over. There's step increases that happen along the way automatically, regardless of pay raises. And we've cut state income taxes 21.25% with probably another 10% tax cut coming this year. Teachers should be making more and taking home more than they ever have before, Fred. But they're not because <laughs> there are other benefits. Well, we know the cost of living has also gone up, but we also know that our health care has gone up. So they're really not necessarily taking home more than they, they have in the past. And <clears throat> to say that, talk to teachers. Talk to teachers, who young teachers who are trying to continue their education with uh, master programs or other graduate work. Uh, that is costly. It, it, they're not taking home more, and that's the that's the true facts. Fred, it's my recollection back in 1988 uh, when Gaston Caperton was first elected, uh, and he uh, 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 and he convened that special session, and they gave teachers a pay raise of I think it was like a three year program, ten percent, ten percent, ten percent, and we went from fiftieth to up somewhere in the mid thirties. In right. terms of uh, comparison to the rest of the country, are, are, is my arithmetic pretty close there? You are close, and I think that was I think that was in '90. Um, you know that I believe that came out of the teacher strike of 1990. But right, right, you're exactly right. And and now here we are. If you don't keep up, if, if you stay stagnant for many many years, which we did, then you're back at 50th, and that's where we are now. Final question, John Gilstrap. <clears throat> because West Virginia has such wildly different cost of living, especially cost of housing from one part of the state to the other, and this is really about affordability and retaining teachers, is the AFT then supportive of locality pay so that the teachers in the higher cost of living areas can, in fact, uh, suffer less than the folks in the, in, with the lower cost of living elsewhere in the state? Well, I, I can't say I can't say that we are supportive of that, but we're always open to sit down and and look at situations. I know that in the Eastern Panhandle, where you all are, that we have a hard time retaining educators because they can travel very short distance and make anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand dollars more annually, is what I'm told. You know. I don't think locality pay necessarily is the answer, but again, let's sit down. Let's be part of the discussions. That's what we're asking for, so we can look at situations and, and see what is a viable plan. Fred, thanks so much for your time this morning. Any final thoughts? Well, I always appreciate talking with you fellas. It's so good, again, to hear John Doyle's voice. And <laughs> he's missed here in Charleston. I hope he's doing well. And John Gilstrap, the same with you. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I want to wish all of you a happy Thanksgiving and uh, take care of yourselves. Thank you, Fred. Good to talk with you, buddy. Good talking with you as well. See